Well, everyone, um, I want to welcome you to the first colloquium of the spring quarter. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, let me remind you of the procedures uh, people like to follow here. Please keep yourself muted during the talk and save your questions for the, the Q&A after. I promise, uh, or I'll promise on behalf of the speaker that they'll stick around until all your questions are answered. Uh, if something comes up that's urgent during the talk, uh, put it in the chat and, and I'll try to monitor that and uh, interrupt as appropriate. Okay, so let, let me begin then. And uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Jeff Pennington. Uh, Jeff grew up in the UK and he was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge. He then came here to Stanford as a graduate student and studied with uh, Patrick Hayden received his PhD as long ago as, I guess, the spring of 2020, a little less than a year ago. Now, much of the impressive work he, he'll be talking about today was actually done while he was a graduate student. And this work is impressive. Uh, I mean, there are lots of indications of that. One is, is that he was offered a faculty position at Berkeley while he was still a graduate student, which he accepted, and uh, he's now on the Berkeley faculty although he's on leave this semester at the Institute for Advanced Study. He was also a co-recipient of the 2020 New Horizons Prize in Physics for calculating the quantum information content of a black hole and its radiation. I believe, I haven't carefully researched it, that, uh, that he is the, quote, earliest career person to ever receive this prize today. Uh, so without further ado, let me, let me turn things over to Jeff, who will tell us uh, about some of this very interesting work on black holes and quantum mechanics. So Jeff, uh, okay. it's, your, it's your show. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, so yeah, this, this talk is, is called Black Holes, Information and Wormholes. It's going to be about all those, those fancy, exciting things. But I'm going to start with something a little more down to earth, which is going to be an egg. Um, and it's, in fact, it's going to be an egg that's going to fall down to Earth. It's going to hit the ground, and it's going to splatter into pieces, as eggs tend to do. And then we're going to stop time, and we're going to take every particle that makes up this exploding egg, and we're going to reverse their velocities. And maybe we're going to turn electrons into positrons and, and do some other stuff like that, but let's not worry about that part. And then we're going to start time again. And the question, of course, is what happens next. As a very simple answer, what happens next is this. So the egg spontaneously reforms, splats together, and its momentum launches it straight up into the air as one solid egg. So at a fundamental fit level, the laws of physics as we know them, the ones that we understand, are reversible. They're the same going forwards and backwards. If you take a state, turn it around, run it backwards in time, it just reverses the process that happened. <coughs> There's another way to think about this, this same, same effect, which is through the idea of, of information and what happens to information as we roll forwards in time. So let's say I have some book and I want to destroy the information in that book. Maybe it's, it's top secret. Maybe I'm just a bit embarrassed about my reading choices. But whatever it is I want to destroy it, how should I go about doing that? Well, the sort of obvious thing is, is maybe I take that book and I put it into a shredder. And that's probably do the job, probably nobody's going to work out what I was reading. But if somebody was willing to put in sufficient effort, they could match up the individual pieces, line them up, and work out um, what the book was and, and reconstruct all the information that was in it. OK, so let's take option two, be a bit more systematic. Just going to take the book, and we're going to burn it. And then it's all gone. And in practice, there is no way anyone is ever getting that information. Back. However, just like for the splattering egg, in principle, the information in the book is still there. It's stored in the positions and the momenta and so on of all the molecules in the air and all the photons getting radiated off to infinity. And if you had access control over all those things and you reverse time, then the book would pop back out of the fire. And so that tells us that fundamentally, you know, knowing that the final state of the system is still enough to learn what was in the book. OK, what about option three? Take that book, throw it into the black hole, just leave the black hole for a while, let it evaporate or whatever. Well, back in 1975, Stephen Hawking claimed that this is different. 
that in this case, the information just genuinely vanishes from the universe. The quantum gravity is not like every other theory that we, we understand. It's fundamentally irreversible. So this is the black hole information problem. And pretty much immediately after Hawking made this claim, then it made a lot of people, for example, Lenny Susskind famously, very unhappy. And you know, they argued that this couldn't possibly be true. And over the last 45 years or so, there were very many increasingly compelling arguments that, that Hawking's calculation just had to be wrong in some way, that this, this claim that the information just fundamentally irreversibly destroyed couldn't be right, that quantum gravity had to be like everything else. But until 2019, what we didn't have was an actual gravitational calculation in actual black holes that says, look, information gets out, you can see it, this is how. Hawking had his calculation that he said, this shows it being destroyed, and there was no calculation that says, no, you're wrong, actually it gets out. And that's what we do now have. We have precise calculations that show the information coming back out. We can see the sort of mistake that Hawking made in the calculation, the thing that he missed that made his calculation wrong. But it's worth saying that these calculations do lead to as many new questions as they give us answers. And so it's, it's certainly not that the problem is fully solved, but certain sub-problems are solved. We've moved on to the next stage. We, we resolved some questions that had, had puzzled us for a long time. And the missing piece in Hawking's calculation is something that's almost too sort of good to be true, too ridiculously sci-fi to be true. It's what's called space-time wormholes. And these are what basically shortcuts through space-time. They're a connection between two points in space-time, just like einstein rosen bridges or the sort of wormholes you see in Star Trek are shortcuts in space. So an einstein rosen bridge is like a, a exists throughout time, but it's a, a connection between point A in space and point B in space. The space-time wormholes are just a connection between point A in space and point T in time to some other point in space and time. And magically, when you include them in your calculations, you see that rather than information being lost, the information comes back out. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's really mostly going to be based on a few papers that I put out in 2019, including ones with, with Steve Schenker, Douglas Stanford, and Jen Bin Yang, one with Adam Brown, Ron Galbin, and Lenny Siskind. Uh, and there were also uh, papers that came out simultaneously with two of the ones I'm going to be talking about, um, and that covered many of the same ground, had the same essential insights, um, but none of their authors are at Stanford currently, so we'll not worry about them. But before I get to that, I'm actually going to spend probably half of this talk just talking about work that Stephen Hawking did and trying to get you a sense of, of what's the background to this problem, why we were confused, why we thought that information had to come out, and so on. So let's start with black hole thermodynamics. So why does that second video that I showed of an egg spontaneously unbreaking never happen in practice? It's pretty simple, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's because to actually make it happen, we'd have to exactly reverse the velocity of every single particle making up the splattering egg. If we just messed up a few of them, instead of it splattering into a, a solid egg and jumping up in the air, it would splatter into another splatter and just end up on the floor in a mess. The reason for this is that there's just a very, very large number of states that basically look like a splattering broken egg, and then a macroscopically indistinguishable, but a different microscopic states. If we evolve backwards in time, all of those have to go to distinct states, and only a tiny fraction of them can actually reform into an unbroken egg, because the number of states that describe an unbroken egg are just much, much smaller. So the way we say this is that the thermodynamic entropy of a broken egg is much bigger than the entropy of an unbroken egg, uh, and the second law of thermodynamics says that in practice, entropy always increases. So something similar happens with black holes. They also appear to have irreversible dynamics. This is a simulation made of two black holes merging for LIGO. They spiral around one another and then form into one bigger black hole. But black holes can never unmerge. If you have two black holes form into one, they'll never split apart into two again. It's just not a thing that can happen in general relativity. There's a theorem about this, going back to Hawking, that says if you look at the total area of all the event horizons of all the black holes in the universe, that can never decrease over time. Right? Unmerging would cause it to decrease if you conserve energy, and so that can't happen. So this smells a lot like the second law of thermodynamics, right? It's some quantity that has to increase over time. You could, of course, say 
pretty reasonably at this point. That's just a coincidence. Um, but that would start to be a slightly harder position to hold because there's a lot of other laws of thermodynamics that were written here. I'm not going to go through them, but it turns out all of them have an analogous law of black hole thermodynamics, sort of equivalent law that is true of general relativity, um, where basically you take the, the law of ordinary thermodynamics, replace the an entropy everywhere it appears by something proportional to the horizon area of the black hole. You replace temperature everywhere it appears by something proportional to the surface gravity of the black hole. And you get a true theorem about black hole thermodynamics. I say proportional to rather than giving you the exact values. Because if you look at all these equations, you can simultaneously rescale by surface gravity and area and keep the, the equations exactly the same. So I could say double surface gravity and half area, and it wouldn't change any of these equations. So we can't quite nail down what the correspondences are at this point. But this is starting to seem like a very, very big coincidence, if that's all it is. But there's still, of course, a very, very big problem and a reason to think maybe this can't be more than a coincidence. Um, and that's that if something has a non-zero temperature, then it needs to radiate energy. But fundamentally, nothing can escape a classical black hole. That's the whole, whole point of it being a black hole. So this seems like a, a big problem. And maybe it's just, you know, there's only so many equations out there. And it's just a weird coincidence. But that's where Stephen Hawking made his, his most famous contribution to physics. And what he argued was that you add in quantum mechanics and you, in fact, magically do get radiation. We'll see in a bit how that, that radiation is able to, to escape, even though that's impossible. Basically, the answer is it was outside all along. Um, but that radiation has a temperature that is indeed proportional to this quantity, the surface gravity. Um, or equivalently, it's proportional to 1 over the black hole's mass times this complicated mess of constants. And just looking at this formula, you can already see how, how impressive a calculation this really is. Right, it's a calculation that involves factors of C. So that tells you that somewhere in there, Hawking's having to take into account relativistic effects. Has a factor of G Newton that tells you there's gravity getting involved. Has a factor of H bar, there's quantum mechanics getting involved. There's a Boltzmann's constant in there, there's thermodynamics getting involved. And of course, there's a pi in there, so there's circles getting involved. So really, all the fundamental major areas of physics are getting represented in this one equation. It's a, a truly one of the deepest, most, most broad reaching equations we know about in physics. And now that we have this formula for T, it's very easy to, to you know, use this first law of thermodynamics we have to, to work out exactly what the, the entropy of a black hole is. And we get this answer that in nice units, it's the area of the event horizon divided by four times Newton's constant. This is the famous Bekenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole. I should note, by the way, that now we have this, this the black hole's radiating energy, then it's no longer true that we have an area theorem. It's no longer true that this area of event horizons of black holes has to increase over time. Instead, that theorem is subsumed into the second law of thermodynamics. The area can decrease so long as some other entropy increases more, so that the total thermodynamic entropy increases. And that's exactly what happens when black holes radiate. They lose energy, they evaporate over time, but the entropy of the radiation is bigger than the lost entropy of the black hole itself. OK, so how did Hawking do this calculation, and, and why does it lead to an information problem? Well, to be able to talk about that, we're going to in, need to introduce our, our second player in the game, which is going to be quantum mechanics. And of course, quantum mechanics is famously weird. Um, and the central weirdness of quantum mechanics is that there exist states of a quantum mechanical system where even when the state of the entire system is known and is precisely defined, then the constituent subsystems that make that up, so the different particles that make it up, whatever it might be, can still be uncertain or noisy. So described by density matrix, which is sort of the quantum version of a probability distribution. So this is the phenomenon of quantum entanglement, and it's a, a, you know, really the deepest and most remarkable thing about quantum mechanics. Right? If we have a classical system, then the state of that classical system is just a list of the state of system one and the state of system two. But in quantum mechanics, that's not true. It's described by a tensor product. 
And you can have these states where, you know, this is a well-defined state on two qubits called the Bell state. Um, but, you know, it's a superposition of both being in the state zero and both being in the state one. And that means you can't define a state of the two individual systems. Instead, it's just random whether they're in zero or one. It's a 50% chance. This uncertainty associated to entanglement, this amount of, of sort of inherent noise uh, to the state of the constituent subsystems can be quantified. It can be quantified by something called an entanglement entropy. Okay, it has entropy in the name because mathematically it's very similar to the thermodynamic entropies we saw before, but interpretation wise, it's very different. Okay, so this is not about uncertainty from us not knowing what actual state it is and just knowing roughly what it looks like, just knowing the macro state. This is an inherent fundamental uncertainty about the state just not even being defined. Okay, so we're really gonna be important in this talk to distinguish entanglement entropy from thermodynamic entropy. They're gonna play very different roles. And the one important property of entanglement entropy that we're gonna need is that if, so long as the sort of global state of the system is well-defined and, and, and known and some precise thing, then the entanglement entropy of any subsystem and the complement of that subsystem, the rest of the system, uh, is always equal. Okay, so, so entanglement entropy is, is describes a, an amount of noise describing the state between A and B. It's not, not a separate one for A and a separate one for B. It's the same for each. That's going to be very important. Okay, so now let's, let's take this idea of entanglement and let's put it in a black hole. Um, so this diagram here, is a black hole. Um, if you're not familiar with these diagrams, I'll just very briefly say what they are. So it's called a Penrose diagram. Uh, and roughly speaking, it's just a diagram representing time going upwards and radius going outwards. We drop the angular directions because they never have anything interesting going on. And this diagram is, is sort of rescaled. It's not scale at all. Distances are inaccurate in order to make sure that light travels at 45 degrees everywhere. So an outwards going light ray will travel at 45 degrees to the right, inwards going light ray goes at 45 degrees to the left. So because we've rescaled it so much, these lines out here are actually at infinite radius. They're infinitely far away from the black hole. Um, and then up here at the top, we have the same famous black hole singularity. So this is, sometimes thought of as sort of the center of the black hole, but really it's a point in time rather than a point in space. This marks the point at which everything has got compressed so much that it, it becomes infinitely strong. Uh, and just the description of classical space-time just breaks down. Quantum effects will become very strong and important. We have no idea about the rules of the game anymore once we get up to this singularity up here. Okay, here be dragons. This is a dragon from, from Game of Thrones, I think from before it became bad. So I'm not gonna be able to say anything about the singularity in this talk because we, we don't have anything interesting to say about it really. We just don't know how it works. But there's one other point in the space time that's equally important, if not more, and that's the black hole horizon, which is this 45 degree line that hits the intersection of the singularity with infinite radius. So this is the last point where if you start going outwards at the speed of light, you're able to escape the black hole and get out to, to infinitely far away from it rather than just inevitably hitting the singularity no matter what you do. And it turns out that for sufficiently large black holes, um, the classical space-time here, description here should be pretty trustworthy. We don't have the crazy problems we have the singularity. All our calculations should be pretty under control. So what we're going to do, everything in this talk, is we're basically going to study quantum mechanical fields you know, the, the electric fields, the magnetic fields, and so on that we have in, in, in our universe in space-time that are going to be propagating in this classical space-time near this horizon. Okay, so we're, we're, you know, we're going to be taking into account gravity and we're going to be doing quantum mechanics, but our space-time is still going to be pretty classical. We're going to be doing what's called semi-classical quantum gravity. And this is something we think we know how to do. We think we understand the rules of the game. We don't think we're doing anything crazy or nonsense, and we think our answers should be sensible. Everything involving Hawking radiation is just going to involve this horizon. Okay, so what actually happens? Why do black holes evaporate? Well, it's a fact about any quantum field theory that any state, even the vacuum state, has entanglement 
between different points in space. If we look at fields in point in space one and point in space two, those fields will be entangled with one another. It won't have separate well-defined states. In particular, this will be true for fields just outside a black hole horizon and fields just inside a black hole horizon. They'll be entangled with one another separately. They'll look noisy. Together, they'll, they'll be entangled in some well-defined state. So this has nothing to do with black holes. This is just about the physics of, of ordinary quantum field theory. However, the black hole horizon does something very important. If we evolve forwards in time, then these nearby points in space get vastly separated. So this one just outside the horizon travels out, outwards at the speed of light and it ends up escaping the black hole and going off to infinity. Meanwhile, the point just inside just gets stuck inside the black hole, hits the singularity, it's never able to escape. These noisy modes that were just outside the black hole that originally just described the entanglement structure of a vacuum in quantum field theory end up becoming this thermal noisy Hawking radiation. And they're entangled with the stuff in the interior of the black hole. If we let the black hole evaporate more, then there's more and more time for stuff that starts closer and closer to the black hole to escape off to the boundary. So we get more and more Hawking radiation. In fact, in quantum field theory, there's formally an infinite amount of entanglement between things outside the horizon and things inside. And so as we allow this time to progress, we just get more and more entanglement. It apparently increases just indefinitely. This is Hawking's argument that we just get more and more noisy Hawking radiation as the black hole evaporates and no information ever comes out. Of it. However, in practice, eventually you're going to reach a point where the, the entanglement entropy of this, this noisy Hawking radiation, the amount of, of uncertainty because of its entanglement with the stuff inside the black hole becomes larger than the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole that I introduced before. This is a time that's normally called the page time after Don Page, who was the first to recognize its significance. And the important thing about it is that it happens when the black hole is still macroscopically large. And so these semi-classical calculations are still completely under control. There's, 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 you know, this Hawking calculation should still be entirely trustworthy. So Hawking claimed, well, this is still true. And you know, maybe when it's really small, then, then stuff breaks down. But certainly at this page time, my calculation is right. We just have, have thermal Hawking radiation and nothing else happens. But there is a problem here, uh, depending on what you mean, what you think the role played by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is. So, what's sometimes called the central dogma of black hole physics is that this Bekenstein Hawking entropy, this thing proportional to the area of the horizon of the black hole divided by four times Newton's constant, is genuinely the thermodynamic entropy of all the possible states that a black hole of that size can be in. So this is something that's, that's known to be true in ADS-CFT. It's known to be true in string theory. Um, and hopefully my arguments in, in earlier slides about how you know, black hole thermodynamics exactly mirror ordinary thermodynamics should at least strongly suggest to you guys that that's the, the, the right way to think about this quantity, that it really is just count, counting the number of states that a black hole can be in. And that's why it's, it's behaving like a, a thermodynamic entropy. Some people do not believe this is true. Most loop quantum gravity people, I think, for example, do not believe this is true. Um, but if you believe it, then it implies an inconsistency between Hawking's prediction and the ordinary rules of unitary quantum mechanics. And the reason for that is that after the page time, we just do not have enough black hole microstates to be able to purify, to be able to be entangled with all this noisy Hawking radiation. Okay, the entanglement entropy of the, the noisy Hawking radiation has to be the same as the entanglement entropy of the black hole if the global state is, is pure and well-defined. Um, but the uncertainty, the entanglement entropy, this un inherent uncertainty in the state from its entanglement with another subsystem can't be bigger than the thermodynamic entropy because that's just the uncertainty we have if we don't know anything about the state at all, right? And then you know, entanglement can't create more uncertainty than just knowing nothing. Um, so this is genuinely a paradox at this point. And there's really only two resolutions if you believe in the central dogma of black hole physics. 
The first is that the assumption of, of unitary quantum mechanics, that the, the global state of, of black hole plus Hawking radiation stays well-defined and stays pure and doesn't become noisy, is just wrong. So this is information loss. This is, is basically what Hawking believed, at least initially. The second possibility is that Hawking's calculation has to go wrong. And this entanglement entropy of this noisy Hawking radiation has to stop going up, has to stop increasing linearly with time at or before the page time, and instead start going down so that it stays below the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, the black hole, which of course is getting smaller with time because the black holes evaporated. Normally, for, for fairly generic arguments based on quantum mechanics, people who believe the latter believe that it, it actually starts going down at the page time and it exactly saturates this, this upper bound on how big it is. So this is something called the page curve. It was again, Don Page provided evidence that in, in typical quantum mechanical systems, that's what happens. And it turns out that if this is gonna happen, if the entanglement entropy is gonna start going down after the page time, then after that point, this Hawking radiation can no longer just be, be, be noisy, has to start carrying some information about the stuff that fell into the black hole. Not only it has to have decreasing entropy, but it has to be in different states depending on, on the stuff that we threw in. And so we're going to see both of these things happen in the, the rest of this talk. We're going to see how to calculate this page curve of it starting to go down rather than continuing to go up, the uncertainty inherent from the entanglement of the state. And we're going to see how after the page time, this radiation starts carrying information about things that we had thrown in. And of course, the things that are going to let us see these things are these space-time wormholes. OK, so there's a sort of loophole in Hawking's calculation. There's a reason that even though it seems so trustworthy, maybe you shouldn't actually completely trust where they trust it. And that's the, basically what Hawking was calculating, matrix elements of this density matrix describing the state of the Hawking radiation. He's saying that up to some very small controlled error, those matrix elements are exactly the matrix elements of a density matrix. But by the time we reach the page time, we have a really, really large amount of Hawking radiation. An order, order one over G Newton amount of Hawking radiation. We've been collecting it for this hugely long time as the black hole slowly evaporates. So this matrix is really, really, really huge. Its, it's size is the dimension of the Hilbert space describing the Hawking radiation, which is e to the entropy of the Hawking radiation, which is e to roughly the initial entropy of the black hole. That's an exponentially big matrix. And if you have that, a matrix that big, then tiny changes to each of the individual matrix elements can completely change properties of the matrix. So even though the individual elements are controlled, your calculation of the whole matrix and other properties of it, things like its, its, you know, its trace, it's, it's distance from other density matrix matrices is completely not under control. So if we want to do a control calculation, we can't just do what Hawking did. We need to do something more direct. We need to do a single calculation that is going to directly compute the entanglement entropy of this Hawking radiation. How do we do that? Well, the answer is it's a bit tricky because entanglement entropy is not and observable in quantum mechanics. There's no measurement that I can do with a single copy of a quantum state that will determine that state's entanglement. This is just because that you can always find a basis for, for uh, any quantum system that consists entirely of unentangled states. There's a sort of trivial classical version of this, which is that there's no way if I have some, uh, either an unknown fixed state or an unknown noisy probability distribution that I can distinguish the two using only a single sample from that probability distribution, right? If I, I sample from, from my either random source or my fixed source, I get some, some state, some object I, I can't use that to, to learn anything at all because, you know, maybe the fixed state was just I, or maybe it was a totally random noisy thing and I just randomly happened to get I. It doesn't provide me any useful information about which of those it was. But in this case, it's really obvious what you can do to, to start learning some information. You can just look at more than one copy, more than one sample from this, this, this either probability distribution or fixed thing. And then I can measure whether I got the same thing both times. 
right? So if I, if I have a, a source that's producing some fixed state i, and then I sample from it twice, and I get the same thing both times, then you know that's some evidence it was a fixed source rather than a completely random not source, because most of the time with a completely random source, I'd get different things on the two equations, on the two samples. So there's a quantum version of this, um, which is that what's called trace of row squared is the expectation value of a particular Hermitian observable on two copies of the system. It's something called the swap operator. But basically what it does is it measures, are my two copies in the same state? OK, so roughly this corresponds in the classical thing to the sum over, over all your possible states of p i of p of i squared. If it's unentangled, i.e. it's some fixed well-defined state, then this is equal to 1. But if it's very highly entangled, then it becomes very, very, very small, because there's only a tiny probability that you, you have uh, both of your samples in exactly the same state. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and calculate in, in semi-classical quantum gravity what trace rho squared is of all this Hawking radiation. So how do we do that? Well, the, the sort of best way we know to do semi-classical quantum gravity, the like most trustworthy way, is what's called a Feynman path integral. OK, so, so how do path integrals work in, in quantum mechanics? Well, basically, you just sum over all configurations, all paths of something like a particle, all ways it can go from point A to point B that are weighted by, by e to the i times the action and have the correct boundary conditions. So we're going to do exactly that, but we're going to do it for gravity. Um, and what are the configurations in gravity? Well, they're geometries. Gravity is a theory of dynamical geometry. OK, so we're going to integrate over all possible geometries of our space time. And we also want to, to sum over all topologies, because on general grounds, we should expect that to be dynamical too. And in practice, of course, except in very simple models, you can't do this full path integral, but you can find uh, the most important contributions to it, because those will be what are called classical saddle points, like solutions to the classical equations of motion. Just like for a particle, the dominant path from A to B will be the straight line. And just by looking at the, the, the action of that path, you can learn a lot about the total path integral. Turns out that for this trace row squared calculation to the Hawking radiation, this thing that's telling us how entangled the Hawking radiation is, that there's actually two configurations that are important. The first is that our two black holes are just completely independent, and they're just independent black holes that look roughly like an ordinary black hole um, that's evaporating, obviously. And if you just include this contribution, then you get the answer that Hawking got. OK, this is effectively what Hawking did, though he was you know, not doing a, a sort of full Feynman path integral in any sense. Um, and it's an answer that, that becomes smaller and smaller and smaller with time. Right, it says that the, the Hawking radiation is becoming more and more noisy. You have less and less uh, chance of getting the same state two times. And so this trace of row squared just decays away. And it keeps decaying away for all time. So this would be the answer showing information loss. But it turns out that there's another configuration that can also be important. And this consists of two black holes that are connected together by a space-time wormhole. So a very schematic drawing here. But this is the space-time wormhole going from one black hole to the other. And this contribution is very, very small. Okay? It starts off, even when we only collected like one qubit of Hawking radiation, it's some tiny thing. It's non-perturbatively sp suppressed by 1 over g Newton. It's like some tiny instanton correction, if you think about instantons. But it turns out that it actually gets larger as the black hole evaporates, because the black hole becomes less classical as it evaporates and it gets smaller. Meanwhile, this, this ordinary contribution without the space-time wormhole is getting smaller. And so at some point, we find a transition where this space-time wormhole contribution becomes bigger than the ordinary one with no space-time wormhole. Magically enough, the time that that transition happens is exactly the page time. It's exactly the point where uh, if we don't want to have information loss, this trace of row squared needs to start getting bigger. But this trace of row squared quantity is actually not a, a particularly great quantity to compute. It's, it's you know, very sensitive to the details of the state and stuff. It's not particularly nice. What we really want to compute is this entanglement entropy quantity that I talked about before. 
And one formula that gives you the entanglement entropy quantity looks a bit like trace of rho squared, but it's you take trace of rho to the n for some arbitrary non-integer n, and then you take the derivative of that, actually minus the derivative of that, in the limit where n is equal to 1. So how on earth do we calculate this thing? Well, it turns out there's a very beautiful trick that goes in slightly different contexts back to Lukovic and Maudicina, where we first look at what happens for integer n. And it turns out that for integer n, as long as we're after this page time where we expect information to start coming out and the entropy to start going down, then trace of rho to the n becomes dominated by a multi-boundary space-time wormhole. So we now have n copies of our, our black hole, that's why it's trace rho to the n, and they all get connected together in one big octopus-like space-time wormhole. So now what do we do? Now we, we do our magic trick. Rather than thinking about this whole thing with n different black holes and them all being connected in, in one big lump, we're going to use the fact that there's a symmetry. There's a symmetry relating these n different black holes. It's a Zn symmetry where we use the fact that a trace is cyclic, right? So we can, we can spin this geometry around so that, that this, the alpha -th black hole goes to the alpha -th plus one -th black hole. And we can take this symmetry and we can quotient by it. So rather than looking at the whole n things, we're just going to look at one little wedge here. And we're going to glue this thing which you know, is related by the symmetry to this thing down here, we're going to glue them together. So this wedge becomes a single continuous object. And now this looks a lot like a single black hole, except for one thing. There's something weird that goes on at this point at the center of this multi-boundary space-time wormhole. And that's what's called a conical singularity. Basically, if we go in a little circle around this point, then uh, we get back to where we started, Rather than having to go a distance of 2 pi r around in a circle to get back when we started, we only have to go 2 pi r over n, because then we get to this point here, and that's immediately glued back onto this, this point here. OK, so now what we have is rather than n boundary space-time wormhole, we have a single black hole with a conical singularity of strength 2 pi over n. Now. There's no reason that n needs to be an integer. Quant conical singularity can have, have any angle around it that we like. And so now we can just tune the strength of the singularity to non-integer values of n and take the limit where n goes to 1, which is what we want for the entanglement entropy. And actually, in that limit, the conical singularity disappears, and we just get an ordinary black hole. And so everything we care about, this entanglement entropy, rather than having to do some complicated, crazy space-time wormhole thing, all we have to do is look at very small perturbations about an ordinary evaporating black hole. These small perturbations are what happens when you introduce this tiny little conical singularity. Turns out that the effect of those perturbations are just to give an entanglement entropy that is proportional to area divided by 4g Newton plus some quantum corrections for the sur a particular surface that is basically where this conical singularity ends up in the limit when we take n to 1. This surface just happen has to satisfy certain equations that are just determined by the, the semi-classical Einstein equations for the, the wormhole solution. Um, and that's what's called a, a quantum extremal surface. And so to, to calculate the entanglement entropy given by these complicated space-time wormhole solutions, all we have to do is look at an ordinary evaporating black hole with no space-time wormhole at all, and then calculate an area of a particular surface that, that satisfies these equations that, that make it what's called a quantum extremal surface. And this is totally magical, because for realistic four-dimensional evaporating black holes, you can't even find in detail what these wormhole solutions look like, but you can find the location of the quantum extremal surface that sort of signals their existence and is all you need to, to know about the entanglement entropy. And so the, the, the easy thing to calculate, trace rho squared, we're only able to compute in, in very simple examples. But this entanglement entropy, which theoretically should be harder and that we, we have to use that calculation for, ends up being much simpler to, to find as an end result, just based on this beautiful general argument. OK. So how does this, this 
you know, what's the answer we get when we, we find this thing? As I say, you can find the, the location of this special quantum extremal surface very, very explicitly. It turns out it sits just like very slightly inside the horizon of the black hole, a Planckian distance inside the horizon of the black hole. And that's, that's you know, you also need to know what, what time it is. Um, and the answer is that it, sort of where it sits on the horizon depends on how much Hawking radiation we've collected. As we collect more Hawking radiation and calculate the entropy of more Hawking radiation, then this special surface moves up along the horizon, goes along a curve that looks roughly like this, moving up and outwards into the top corner. The black hole's evaporating, so the area of this surface is therefore getting smaller and smaller over time. That's exactly what we wanted. We've got an entanglement entropy that's decreasing over time once we're after the page time and these, these wormhole solutions dominate. And because um, this surface is almost exactly on the vent horizon of the black hole, then the entanglement entropy we get is, is the area of the surface divided by 4G. That's exactly the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. So we're exactly matching this, this prediction that has been made uh, just based on avoiding paradoxes with information loss. We derived this famous page curve that had been predicted since the 90s. Okay, so that's great. It's awesome. We, we, we get the page curve for black holes. Um, but we'd like to do more than that. We'd like to actually see information coming out and see that if something fell in, then, then its state is, is fundamentally determined by the state of the Hawking radiation at later times. So that's what I want to talk about for the last section of this talk. OK, so in an ideal world, how would we do this? Well, we would have some exact description of the microscopic dynamics of the black hole, you know, maybe some string theory thing or, or you know, have control over the CFT. It would be in ADS CFT, we'd actually be able to calculate it and we'd be able to work out what the, the state was of the radiation at some late time and just see, yes, that state uh, you know, is different depending on the state of the stuff that we threw in. We can use it to recover the state of the stuff we threw in. But that's much too hard, at least, at least with our, our current levels of power and control and skill. Instead, we're going to do something simpler. We're going to black box away all the dynamics of the black hole using what's called general purpose quantum error correction tools. OK, so this is where all these developments that have been made for understanding quantum computers and, and trying to not lose control and lose noise over, over quantum computers are going to come into play and they're really going to save us and, and give us insights about black holes. Because the people building quantum computers want to know how to correct noise and recover information with noisy evolution. And they want a general rule as to how to do that that works for sort of any version of noise you might have. So basically, there's formulas you can plug in that include the noise and the details of the, the black hole dynamics, but they do so in a way that's sort of black boxed away. And you, you, don't, you don't need to care about the details, you just need to know that it's something. Effectively, what happens is that, that the quantum computer you're using to recover the information is going to simulate the black hole evaporation process. Okay, and its simulation combined with the, the real data it's getting from the Hawking radiation, it's going to compare its simulated Hawking radiation to the real Hawking radiation. It's going to use that to learn about the stuff that was, was thrown into the black hole. So this is a calculation that we can do, this, this simulation plus real black hole. And what we find, which is totally crazy, and, and you know, there's, there's questions about how literally we should take it, is that information escapes because you end up with a space-time wormhole that connects the real actual black hole to the simulation of the black hole and your quantum computer that you're using to, to learn about the information. And the information basically passes through that wormhole and that's how your, 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 your algorithm is able to, to learn what it was. Um, and of course, um, you know, whether this black hole is, is the dominant contribution or not depends on whether you're after the page time. And so if you're after the page time, you're able to extract information. If you're before, the algorithm just fails and you don't learn anything. So we conclude, you know, you can show that this algorithm will work whenever any algorithm will work. So we conclude that it's impossible, that there's no information in the Hawking radiation before that time. That's exactly what we, we again expected on these, these general grounds of how quantum mechanics works. So this is the slide where I say that everything on the last slide was a lie. 
or at least that it was very oversimplified. When I said that you have a real black hole and a simulation of the black hole, that's not true. Just like for the entanglement entropy, what you really end up doing when you do this calculation, you take an analytic continuation in the number of simulated black holes. And you actually take an analytic continuation where the total number of simulated black holes ends up going to zero. So that means the total number of black holes, including the real black hole, ends up being one. And it's sort of like the, uh, uh, the page curve calculation. It ends up just involving special surfaces in one copy of a black hole. Of course, if you're actually doing this process with an actual quantum computer, um, that's not something you can do. You can't analytically continue the algorithm you're using. That's, that's mathematical nonsense. Okay? This is just a mathematical trick that lets us work out what the answer would be uh, if you do this operator. If you actually want to implement this, this, this operator rather than analytically continuing it, what you need to use is something called Grover search, which is one of the two quantum algorithms that like, actually exist and are useful for anything. Um, but it turns out that this involves not simulating the black hole zero times, not simulating the black hole once, but simulating the black hole exponentially many times. Exponential in the, the entropy of the Hawking rate of the, the black hole. So that's exponential in, in you know, e to the 10 to the 70 or something. It's the, the number of, of simulations that we need to do. This is incredibly, 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 ridiculously beyond impossibly complicated. Uh, it's not like, oh, this would take longer than the lifetime of the universe. It's that it's rude to compare it to the lifetime of the universe because it's so, so much longer than the lifetime of the universe. So in practice, information that falls into a black hole is lost forever. There is no way to get back out. Even though Hawking was, was wrong from an information theoretic point of view, from a computational complexity point of view, he was completely exactly right. And this is sort of crucial. You know, This is why uh, for ordinary everyday calculations of simple things you can do with the Hawking radiation, then, then Hawking's calculation is the, gives the dominant contribution and you don't get any of these weird space-time wormholes. These space-time wormholes require doing, doing something very special and, and complicated to make them dominant. Okay, so that's the provisos about how you can never actually do this in practice. But uh, you know, as good theoretical physicists, we're not gonna let that stop us. So let's look at the question of what information actually comes out and when. As I said, because you have this analytic continuation in, in the number of simulations, turns out that, that what can be extracted and what can't involves exactly the same special quantum extremal surface that showed up in our calculations of entropy, right? It's exactly the same special yellow dot here. And basically the way it works is that anything to the left of this yellow dot in our, our Penrose diagram is secretly encoded in the Hawking radiation. And if we do some complicated, complicated stuff to the Hawking radiation involving these simulations of the black hole, then we can pull that information out through a wormhole and, and get it out and, and measure it and do whatever we want with it. Anything in this blue region to the right of the special surface, there's just nothing we can do about it. We try and make a wormhole that pulls it out, just doesn't work, it doesn't go through the wormhole, nothing happens. Okay, so this green region, the special region to the left of the surface that, that is encoded in the Hawking radiation is called the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation. But that's just some fancy words. It's, it's the region that can be pulled out through a wormhole by doing complicated stuff to the Hawking radiation. Okay, so let's, let's get more practical here. Let's say we throw my copy of Twilight into the black hole. And let's throw it in after the page time because before the page time is not very interesting because no information comes out until the page time. Okay, so immediately the special surface exists and everything to the left of this special surface can be can be pulled out through a wormhole. But if we look at the world line of this diary, it falls in. The way it travels through space time, we see that that's not where it goes. It travels to the right of the special surface, it goes to the blue region. We can't pull it out through a wormhole. We can't learn anything uh, about the diary. No information escaped. And this is good because at the moment, we only have the information that had the Hawking radiation that had already escaped before we threw the diary in. So it would be pretty contradictory if that already had the information about the diary we haven't thrown in yet. That would be fairly ridiculous. 
But what happens if we now wait a little bit and collect a bit more radiation? So we now collected these few extra quanta of Hawking radiation. We now have this larger set of Hawking radiation we can use to try and learn about the state of the diary. That means that the, the, the special surface, the quantum extremal surface, changes. As I said before, it moves up along the horizon, up and to the right. Turns out that if you wait for more than what's called the scrambling time of the black hole, which is some very short time, it's, a, it's order seconds for, for astrophysical black holes, then this same world line of the diary is in exactly the same place as before. But previously, it was to the right of the special surface. Now, because that surface has moved, it's to the left, goes to this green region. And that means we can pull it out through a wormhole. By doing complicated manipulations on the Hawking radiation, we can learn that I was reading Twilight rather than some cooler book. And so the information has escaped. This was a very famous prediction by my advisor, Patrick Hayden and John Presco um, back in 2007. But they made that prediction again, just based on simple toy models of quantum mechanics and assuming that information isn't lost in black holes and that they're just ordinary quantum mechanical systems using some properties then dynamics that seem to be true. And they, they predicted that this is how it should work. But now we're doing gravity calculations and we're getting on the nose to the linear coefficients and everything exactly the same time scale that you have to wait. So that's pretty damn cool. Okay, let me talk about, about one last pretty cool thing um, that we can find out about or, or help explain um, with these calculations, and that's the firewall paradox. And I should say, compared to some of the other calculations, how you interpret this one is, is a bit more still up in the air, um, but it's clearly telling us something. OK, so what is the firewall paradox? Well, those of you who are in physics about 2012 or so and went to any colloquium or anything by a, a high energy theorist will have, have heard about this. But the basic idea is the following. We have some late time Hawking quanta that I've shown in red here that's going to come out and, and get away from the black hole. And because we claim that information is escaping and that the, the entropy of Hawking radiation is going down, then this late time Hawking quanta has to be entangled with all the earlier honky, Hawking quanta that made up the earlier radiation. But we also know just because of Hawking's calculation, and really this has to be true for any state that, that doesn't have some crazy energy barrier sitting at the horizon, is that this late time Hawking quanta also has to be entangled with something the other side of the horizon, right? with its, its partner across the horizon of the black hole. But there's a famous theorem in quantum mechanics called monogamy of entanglement that says one thing can't be entangled with two different things at the same time. So if system A is entangled with system B, it can't also be entangled with system C. So how do these, these calculations with the wormholes help resolve that problem? Well, the answer is very simple. Let's take this, this interior partner of the late time Hawking quanta, let's evolve it back in time. What we see is that it ends up in this green region. It ends up to the left of the, the special quantum extremal surface. What does that mean? It means that we can sort of pull it out by doing stuff on the early Hawking radiation, by doing some very complicated stuff to the early Hawking radiation. It means it's not an independent degree of freedom from the early Hawking radiation. It's actually the same degree of freedom all, all along. It's just a different description of it. So it's not one thing being tangled with two different things. It's one thing being tangled with the same thing in two different descriptions. It's like, imagine you said a qubit was entangled with both a logical qubit in a toric code or something like that, and entangled with a large set of, of physical superconducting qubit modes in some physical quantum computer, right? That's not violating monogamy and entanglement because you've just told me twice that it's entangled with the same thing. This works sort of exactly the same way, right? If, we, if, if this is the same mode, as some complicated thing acting on this stuff, then there's no monogamy of entanglement paradox. So this is sometimes called ER equals EPR. It's a proposal that was made pretty quickly after the original firewall paradox. But again, we're having these calculations that are uh, you know, essentially deriving that from a gravity calculation, at least if you, you interpret it in the most natural way. I also want to emphasize actually that the, the sort of full story here is way more complicated than I made it out. 
So these, these sort of Hawking quanta that I've drawn are not like local objects. They're spread out a bit in space. And that means this isn't really all in the green region. And also this thing isn't perfect. Late time Hawking quanta isn't perfectly entangled with the early Hawking quanta. So there's a load of like, you know, quantitative corrections here, but there's some magic that happens with the equations that define a quantum extremal surface that make everything magically cancel out and it, it all works out and, and you get exactly the same consistent things in the two different calculations. The one where you're, you're saying this is entangled with its interior partner and the other way you're saying it's entangled with the, the early radiation. Um, so everything works out really magically. Honestly, to me, it's one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for this whole story. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically out of time, um, but I just want to talk about, for one slide, because uh, I, I gave a sort of very hypey, excited, we now know a lot of stuff we didn't know before, uh, statements throughout this talk, uh, but I really want to emphasize that not everything is resolved. This, the, the, the information paradox is not solved in the sense that we, we understand all the details and know how everything works. And in fact, these new calculations make create some sort of mysteries of their own. Um, so these space-time wormholes give a lot of sensible answers to, to questions that have sort of, we haven't been able to answer sensibly for, for decades and decades. Um, but they lead to these, these new questions that may haunt us for the next few decades. And in fact, the, the best example of this is something that has nothing to do with me, but a paper from April, 2019, and one from 2018 by Saad Schenker and Stanford. And what they calculated was something called a, a black hole spectral form factor. Don't worry about the details of what this is. It's just some quantity that, that uh, roughly speaking, it's the time evolved version of the partition function for a black hole. And in gravity, this seems to decay to zero when you, you take very late times, you take little t to infinity which is something that's just impossible for, for any finite entropy system, which you know, a black hole should be if we believe in the beckenstein hawke entropy. Instead, a finite entropy system should have tiny fluctuations about zero, little tiny amount of noise that sort of e to the minus the entropy in size. So what Shard, Senker, and Stanford did is they computed the square of this spectral form factor, which would average out that noise. And so it will always be positive rather than averaging half the time positive and half the time negative. And what they found was a space-time wormhole contribution that made, made this quantity z squared be, be non-zero, be slightly bigger than zero, even when you took the limit of very, very late times. So that's great. Space-time wormholes have again like given us what we wanted. They, they've given us the, the, the sensible answer that's consistent with a finite entropy system. But on the other hand, it's really weird and nonsensical um, because we're getting an answer that z squared is non-zero, but z itself is still equal to zero when we go to very, very late times. So it's, it's much, much smaller. Yet the, the z squared should just be the square of z, at least, at least in ordinary quantum mechanical systems. So what seems like it's maybe happening in this case is that gravity is actually computing an average over a large number of different microscopic sets of dynamics. And then these wormhole contributions are computing a difference between the average of a square of a quantity and the square of the average of the quantity. So, so really this is computing the sort of average of z squared and this is computing the average of z. And then there's no paradox with one being zero but the other not being zero. What we don't know is whether this is generally true. We know in some very, very simple toy models of sort of 2D gravity, uh, then it's where we can do the sort of most explicit calculations and we really find that this is definitely true, um, then it seems like it's the case. Um, but our sort of best theories of quantum gravity, it seems like maybe it's not. Uh, and in those cases, we don't have enough control over the calculations to really nail down um, whether Z squared is actually different from Z or if there's just a large number of different from calculating Z and then squaring it, or if there's just some large number of, of extra contributions that we don't have good control over that are a bit weird and quantum um, that make it so that actually Z squared is equal to the square of Z. Um, so there's, there's new mysteries. We, we, yeah, we, we, we haven't answered all the questions. We have plenty of stuff um, to be going on with for, for the next you know, months or years or decades, depending on, on how hard they turn out to be. But yeah, having said those provisos of, of you know, there's still an awful lot we don't understand, 
I want to make some some final comments. And since this is a colloquium, I'm going to be shamelessly hypey and excited and, and positive about, about progress and stuff. Um, and really, the, the, the point I want you to take away from this talk is that everything I have said in this entire talk has just been about semi-classical gravitational path integrals. And that's really since people started thinking about quantum gravity, since Feynman did and so on. That's been obviously the right conceptual framework, at least uh, within infective field theory, for, for how to do quantum gravity. So it's a really robust, trustworthy way to do, do quantum gravity as long as you're, you're in a regime where these things are under control. Um, but to actually make the progress we've made, even though it ended up just using these, these 50, 60 year old tools, um, then we needed all these technical tricks and these technical innovations and ideas and ways of thinking about things and so on that, that, that made people be thinking about the right set of ideas. And most of them came out of what's been called it from qubit, these, these you know, innovations of applying uh, quantum information ideas to gravity, quantum error correction and so on, various ideas from the last 10 years, the SYK model that led to these averaging ideas and so on. Um, all came out of that. And in turn, the it from qubit came out of studying ADS CFT and trying to understand better this duality between quantum gravity theories and ordinary quantum mechanical theories. ADS CFT came out of the, the, the dualities and, and D brains revolution in string theory in the 90s, where, where people started understanding these non perturbative objects in string theory. That came out of, of studying perturbative string theory from the 80s and so on. Um, and in turn, if you really go all the way back, People like Lenny, who, who first started thinking about string theory, were caring about nuclear physics and, and Reggie trajectories. So sort of you know, doing all this work, it was a very, very long road down, round, but sometimes you can't just make the stroke of genius or whatever in one go. You need enough other stuff going on that, that you know, suddenly it's no longer needing a stage of genius. You just need to be using the right tools at the right time and think about the right problem. And it's like reasonably obvious what the, the right approach is to do. And that's, that's why we have multiple papers coming out on the same day, like, like you know, saying the same things. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess my, my final takeaway from the talk is quantum gravity is really, really hard. Uh, we're not anywhere close to being done. Um, sometimes it seems further away than ever. Uh, but if you look at where we are compared we were in the past, there is, there is genuine progress being made over time. And it, it's not just coming up with new speculative ideas. There's, there's progress even when it comes to solving problems in frameworks that have existed for decades. Um, yeah, thanks. That's all I have to say. Well, let's all unmute ourselves and thank Jeff for this elegant talk. So, so now I want to throw the floor open to, to questions. I guess the easiest way is if you just raise your hand in the chat and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself. Uh, so are there people with, with uh, questions? I, I guess, who do, uh, do I see anybody with a hand raise? I see Kaipak with a hand raised. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. That's, I think I've got a. Oh, you've got a. Room here. This is, this is Roger Blanford here. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Please. Uh, I seem to have uh, got the substitute name, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I can't cook. Just like us ask a question about the, the entropy. There have been historically various attempts to calculate independent of the Hawking temperature by essentially counting states. And even before you know, the string theory approaches, um, well, Beckerstein himself, but also um, uh, Zurich, Fro uh, Froloff, um, Wald, and various other people trying to get a value, you know, a numerical value for the entropy. Uh, w were those approaches wrong or, or incomplete? Yeah, I don't know much about the, the Beckenstein stuff. Um, I would say the string theory calculations are, you know, they're calculating something deeper in some ways and, and, and less what you want in, in others. So they're, they're actually calculating the microscopic descriptions of the state and, and actually calculate, counting them up. 
On the other hand, most of them are sort of for extremal black holes and, and rely on, on supersymmetry to, to change the coupling. And, and so in some sense, they're less capturing what you want. Um, roughly speaking, what these calculations are analogous to is just the Euclidean path integral calculation of the entropy, right? So there's, there's an old calculation mm -hmm. going back to Hawking and so on that just says we're going to do a Euclidean path integral with certain boundary conditions. We're going to require the solution be smooth, and and to avoid conical singularity, you 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 end up with an entropy that that's given by the the area. Essentially, these are doing the same thing. It's a, a Euclidean gravity path integral. We're computing something. You know, rather than just computing the sort of thermal entropy of a black hole, we're we're computing the entanglement entropy when you let it evaporate. But it's the same level of an effective field theory calculation that seems to know a lot of answers, but we're still not really, doesn't know the full microscopics of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I, I still think there's, there's a, a story to tell about the, the microscopic um, evaporation process and, and how exactly the, the, the exact state of the Hawking radiation is determined in the fundamental theory. Really, uh, what this is, is that you know, the whole information problem was that there was a calculation that seemed like it was trustworthy in effective field theory, but it gave a wrong answer. It gave a information is being lost answer. What we can now say is, okay, that's because that effective field theory calculation missed something. And indeed you can calculate that particular thing robustly in effective field theory, and you get a sensible answer that agrees with information not being lost. Uh, but it doesn't tell us any more insight about uh, the more fundamental theory, which we, we still sort of need to, to determine the exact answers. So it's sort of, you know, if you told me five years ago, we'd be able to calculate, derive the page curve. Um, I would have thought there had been much bigger progress. I would have thought we like had some revolution in string theory or something and like some, some incredible new theory of everything or something like that. Uh, and this is sort of instead the, the minimal amount of progress that, that gives you the, the page curve and so on. Um, but it's also, yeah, the, the, the hope was that you needed this microscopic information to get it right. Um, but really, it always seemed like you didn't, and that was the problem. Uh, so it's just, it was right. You didn't need microscopic insight to calculate the page curve. Does that answer your question? Well, uh, I was asking a simpler question, actually, but it's just, just getting the right coefficient for the, um, the entropy. Yeah. But, so I think uh, my answer was that I think those are, are trying to do something, something beyond what these calculations are doing, right? They're trying to like find all the microscopic, the microstates of the black hole and count them up. This is just trying to, to do sort of an effective field, calculation, field theory calculation that doesn't need to know all of that and can still get the basic answers yeah. right. Okay, uh, well, fine. thanks very much. Uh, so other questions? Maybe it's easier if people just speak up. Uh, so I, in case I miss you. Well, if there, if there are, uh, if nobody else is speaking up, I'll, I'll uh, take this opportunity. Uh, Jeff, I don't have to tell you that you know, one of the most dramatic places that something like Hawking radiation occurs is in cosmology, where we think it forms the seeds of a structure in cosmic inflation, where instead of a black hole horizon, you have a disinter horizon and inflating geometry. Uh, have you thought at all about the consequences for these ideas there? Yes. Um, I, I don't think I've made any progress from thinking about them, but I've thought about them, um, as, as as everyone, I think, I assume, including you. Um, and some people have sort of made a bit of progress, right? There were, there were some papers that came out last summer. I don't feel like, I think those papers are interesting. I don't feel they've, they've captured the the essential, the the, the deepest insights of, of what the hell is going on with the Decidio entropy. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the the trouble is it's just so hard to to know what to calculate in cosmology, right? You're always having to you either calculate everything at future infinity, but should we really be 
like like should you put a de Sitter infinity there or is that just wrong because de Sitter, it should all be metastable anyway so we're trying to have a load of like frw like patches like little hats um or we yeah i i, I don't know what the calculation is to do and and Okay. I, I feel like enough. people know a lot more than me, but I don't think anyone does really, right? Like, uh, yeah. Fair, fair, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, like there, there's people in this room much more qualified than me to, to talk about it, but I, 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 I'm not sure they'd be actually able to say terribly much more than me in terms of really nailing down the answers. Okay, fair, fair enough. I guess, uh, well, that, that I'll certainly accept that as an answer. Uh, so, are there other questions that people want to ask? I might have a, I have a question. question. Okay. Yeah, so, go, go uh, well, so, now, all right, so you guys <laughs> decide who goes first. It's like bosses. Yeah. Right. Uh, Patrick, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so, the causal structure predicted by general relativity um, is, as a result of your calculations, definitely incorrect but can be can something precise be said about the circumstances in which that causal structure will be will be accurate so you mean on the grounds that that something in the interior is not an independent degree of freedom from all the Hawking radiation is that the sense that you're um well both both that or what kinds of actions taken in the exterior um We'll, we'll for which do kinds something of actions will it be safe yeah, yeah. to trust the causal structure predicted by GR? Yeah, I mean, like the, the answer we would like to give, right, is that anything simple or, or even like polynomially complicated or something should should be causal. Um, so yeah, there, there's you know, the, the argument from Python's lunch and stuff like that is 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 basically that that anything a causal is is exponentially hard to do. Um, though you you also have the thing of like if you if you have some closed bubble universe or something and something's entangled with that, that one qubit's entangled with that, then fundamentally that entire closed universe is in some sense encoded in the one qubit, and then nothing could be that complicated to do. Uh, so it's yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think my answer is yeah. It has to it has to be the the simple simple things, uh, uh, semi classical and, and respect the the semi classical causal structure. Uh, you'd also like to make some statement about if you only look at a few degrees of freedom, like you only have a problem if you look at more than uh, the Bekenstein Hawking number of degrees of freedom. That there's there's various sort of rules of thumb you could give. Um, but I think that's still something we we don't understand that well is is why when and where exactly these causal the causal structures allowed to break down because the the only time we can see it is for these very special calculations where it's it's still semi classical just semi classical with some some crazy dominant saddle that has space time wormholes and stuff. If I do some arbitrary exponentially complicated thing, then then it's not clear like yeah um, how 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 to do the calculation at all in a controlled way. Um, all right, thanks. Greg? Yeah, I just ha had a maybe a vague question about, do you think the knowledge of the precise final state after the black hole has fully evaporated will necessarily need to know about the singularity and how it's resolved? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, uh well maybe let's like which what would be your guess i mean no one probably has an answer to yeah that. yeah exactly um I, I i don't know what my guess would be um i guess one possibility is that any calculation that gets that doesn't really involve an interior at all um and instead involves sort of holography on the horizon or something like like and you know, the, even the notion of the interior involves having to coarse grain in some way so that, that it doesn't make sense. Um, one possibility is it's something involving the singularity. Uh, one possibility is that, that 
you know, you, you, you have smooth geometries and you have no non-smooth geometries and you add them all up and it, it in some complicated enough way and you, you get a particular answer for the final state and everything cancels that you have some magic cancellations that, that, uh, yeah, make a, a particular fairly complicated state pop out for the Hawking radiation. Um, and in that case, I mean, anytime you're having to do a ca calculation that involves summing over a lot of different geometries to get the right answer, then you, you have the question of what happens if you jump in and, and what geometry do you experience? And that's not terribly clear. Um, what the, the rules are for deciding that question, I guess. Um, yeah, I, the simple answer is I don't know. That, that's just some okay. big okay. words. Um, Anybody else? Mentioned the ER equals EPR. So do the yep. things you discussed mean that, that ER equals EPR has to be true in some sense, or is that reading too much into it? Sure, I would say so. If you, yeah, cal calculations can always be interpreted in different ways when you don't have the, the full microscopic theory and, and know exactly what the, the ontological interpretation of any, any calculation is. Um, but the, the most natural interpretation of it is, is saying that in, in some sense, the R equals EPR is right. Um, yeah, I, I guess, so, so even this, this notion of a quantum extremal surface and the, the fact that that's the, the right quantity, um, that sort of treats entanglement and area in the same way. It, it's, it's a quantum extremal surface is an extremum of entanglement, of area plus entanglement. Um, so... Yeah, it, 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 in the narrow sense of they play the same role in the quantum extremal surface prescription, then entanglement is equal to, to area. Um, and, you know, that's something you can derive with the replica trick. Uh, so, yeah, ER equals EPR can mean a lot of different things from, from the thermofield double state is dual to a two sided black hole to uh, a pair of entangled qubits has a, a dual bulk geometry with a, a wormhole connecting them um and you know the latter statement it's it's not clear what it means so so you know you'd have to make a precise notion of that but um it's certainly certainly in the spirit of the r equals epr okay anybody else going once Going twice. Okay, I guess you're free, Jeff. So let's let's thank Jeff once again and uh, for a very clear talk. That was a great talk, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you uh, soon. So, Jeff, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot. That that was. Uh, it, it Thanks was, for inviting me. It was, great. It was yeah, fun. That was a pleasure.